I understand many of you are from Pakistan, which is one of my favorite countries. I was there last November and the year before and traveled by camel across the Cholistan Desert to Uch Sharif. And in fact, the cover of my book on Mary the Blessed Virgin of Islam, the, these particular patterns, and this is a photograph I took in Uch Sharif, the wonderful tile dome. And um, I like Multan also, very beautiful places to be. Um, I've been asked today to talk about uh, a book we published called Early Sufi Women. And I've been interested in Sufism um, since the 60s. I became a Muslim because I was interested in Sufism. But when I got to Cairo and lived there for 10 years and studied at Azhar, my dream is just to be a simple Muslim. I mean, if I could be a good Muslim, I think I would be nearly like a saint or something. <laughs> but anyway, I, I'm very interested in spirituality. And all the books I publish are not, although they are scholarly and translations of Islamic classics, Al-Ghazali and so on, um, my only interest in publishing is to give uh, books to people which they can use to uh, strengthen and purify their own inner lives. And, in, and so therefore, um, that's my only interest actually. And so this particular book that I've been asked to talk about today is interesting because it's a book about the early uh, spiritual women in Islam between the 8th and 10th centuries from Central Asia through the Near East to Egypt. And there was a writer called Asulami who lived in the 10th century. And he wrote a very great work. He wrote uh, commentaries of the Quran and he wrote um, other great works. But his big work is called Tabakata Sufiya, which is about the generations of the Sufis. And there was an appendix to that work which was lost, and that was about the early women Sufis. And this work has been lost for many, many years. And it so happened that we recovered it from the King Faisal Foundation in Riyadh and gave it to Rukaya Cornell. She's a Moroccan married to Vincent Cornell, Mansour, and she, they were at Duke, and she translated it into English. I just wanted to show you something to realize what she was up against. I brought you a couple of pages of the photocopy of the manuscript so you could see how difficult that is. Imagine that. <laughs> in, any, in any case, I'm going to introduce uh, this subject and then what I would like to do after giving you a bit of an overview about the early Sufi women in Islam, I'm going to um, read you some of the things. They are uh, said by some of these women in the early days so that we can meet our sisters of a thousand years ago, more, and hear some of their thoughts as well. Um, as spiritual masters and exemplars of Islamic piety, these women served as respected teachers and guides in the same way as did Muslim men, often surpassing men in their understanding of Sufi doctrine, the Quran, and Islamic spirituality. Whether they were scholars, poets, founders of Sufi schools, or individual mystics and ascetics, they embodied a wisdom that could not be hidden. And what's so wonderful about Rakaya Cornell's book is this the first time this has been in English. And it, it has each story in English and then the Arabic is on the other side. The major theme in this work is that of servitude. And of course we all know that we are all Abd Allah. My, my name is Aisha Abdullah. We are all uh, servants of Allah. And this was the essence of the Sufism of these early women, according to Asulami. Of course, we know ibadah, the uh, acts of worship, are incumbent on all Muslims. There was a Sufi in Baghdad in the 10th century called Ibn Ta'a. And Asulami quotes him as saying, 
Ubudiya is a combination of four traits. To be true to one's covenants, to preserve moral rectitude, to be satisfied with whatever one finds, and to patiently bear what has been lost. It also means the suppression of the desires of our lower ego or our nafs. Salba salvation from the nafs, says Ibn Ata'ah, can only be purchased with servitude. The nafs, by its nature, hastens toward disobedience. But through effort, the slave restrains its evil desires. He who abandons effort has given free rein to the nafs and ignores discipline. It is for this reason that Al Janaid has said, now this is really quite profound. When I read this, my hair stood on end. It's about the nafs, our ego. Al Janaid said, he who helps his nafs attain its desires is a partner in the action of his nafs. That's pretty scary. Of course, we all know about servitude because if you think about it, we are all servants of each other. We serve our children, they serve us. Our servants serve us, we serve our servants. You know, it's, it's, it's an incredible interweaving of servitude. But for, for a Sulami, being a slave of God, Abdullah was a necessary prerequisite to becoming a friend of God, Wali Allah, and finally a saint. As a spiritual method, the practice of servitude works on the outward and inward natures of the human being at the same time. Outwardly, it cultivates the Sufi attributes of abstinence, patience, poverty, humility. Without these attributes, the human being is a slave to his own ego. Inwardly, the practice of servitude cultivates fear, worshipfulness, gratitude, reliance on Allah, tawakkul. These are the attributes that lead to perfection in religion, ihsan. There was a certain female Sufi, Suraya, and she said, the ultimate of what is said to be the best of knowledge is the knowledge of Lord 